Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming. Uh, see, there's still a few people making their way in, so I'll wait just a minute. But um, I hope you all had a nice weekend. Certainly, Saturday's weather was terrific. Maybe not so much yesterday's, but uh, I tried to enjoy it as best I could. So, um, if there are any questions before we begin, do they have any questions on anything? Okay, so two quick announcements, which I also messaged on Teams. Remember, we've got our quiz on Wednesday. It's going to be open from 11 a.m. to 11 p.m. Uh, you've got the 15 minutes to take it. It's going to include everything from the first class through Wednesday's class. So although it is open before class, I would recommend maybe uh, waiting until after class to actually take the quiz because we'll, there will be some content from the uh, class on Wednesday. Uh, it's all online. It's open book, open notes. So it should be straightforward. If you want to see some examples of the kinds of questions I'll have, uh, there is a practice quiz uh, with 10 questions that are similar to the kind uh, that I will have uh, on the actual quiz on Wednesday. So that should be on your OWL now. Uh, there's no time limit on that one. It should be open for the next three or four days, uh, but it will run in exactly the same format as the actual quiz on Wednesday. If so you want to see what some of the questions are like or just sort of practice uh, some, of the, uh, some of the things you wanted to study, uh, I would recommend checking that uh, out, and it should be available as of now. Any other questions before we begin? All right, so then let's not waste too much more time. Uh, the next, let's go ahead and do that, enable. Well, while I'm at it, let me just make sure that I am uh, on the right video, or sorry, the right audio. How do I get back my little thing here? I want to make sure that I'm on line in. Okay, it looks like everything is good. Uh, and then what's the thing that I used to get rid of? Hide floating meeting control. Well, that's a lot, so I'm just going to go ahead and play it. Okay, so um, where was I? Oh, right. So we've been talking a lot about perception, attention, and low level cognitive processes, everything that exists sort of in the outside world. From here on in, though, from this week and next week, we're going to be talking about uh, the next stage. So after we've processed things perceptually, and after we've paid attention to things and we've restricted whether it's in a bottleneck early selection or a late selection model, we've abstracted features and we've uh, con combined the features into representations. We want to talk now about how memory works. Uh, so before we talk about models of short-term and long-term memory, I want to talk about two con concepts which are closely related to the idea of perception. The first is mental imagery. So we're going to talk about visual imagery today. And that's a form of knowledge representation that's closely connected to visual perception. It uses some of the same, uh, some of the same brain areas. Uh, and it works in a way that is similar to, uh, uh, to perception. On uh, the next class, which is online, is going to be on general theories of knowledge representation, including some which are closely connected to perception. So those will be the perceptual symbol systems, as well as moving into the idea of abstract knowledge representation systems. That's the online lecture for this week. And then we'll talk about a very specific kind of knowledge representation, a concept or a category. Uh, and that'll give us some background in terms of understanding how knowledge is represented in the mind. Uh, that's everything that's going to be included on the quiz. Uh, then we've got a long weekend coming up, and we'll come back and talk about memory. So for now, let's talk about mental imagery. Uh, is auditory and visual imagery. We're mostly going to talk about visual imagery. Uh, these are memory representations that preserve visual and spatial information in a way that's analogous to the visual and spatial information in the physical world. So if I ask you what street you live on uh, or your street address, you can return that fact, you can answer the question without having to imagine your street. Right? You don't have to picture your street in your mind's eye. Uh, you don't have to try to imagine looking at your street. 
uh, you just know your address, right? Just like you would know your email address or you would know uh, any other kind of basic fact about yourself. You don't imagine seeing it. Um, however, I could ask you to imagine or to think about or to answer the question of what color is the house next to yours on your street? Now, most of us, when we try to answer that question, will probably imagine standing in the street. This is how I would answer it. I would imagine standing in the street, uh, looking at my house, and then looking at the house next to it, and trying to sort of imagine or recreate the experience of looking at that house in my mind's eye. Now, I should say, not everyone has uh, the same uh, internal mental imagery abilities. Uh, some people have limited uh, visual imagery abilities and do most of this, uh, answer most of these kinds of questions by retrieving propositions and facts. So it's not universal, the experience of having a mind's eye, uh, but it's generally true for most people that when they answer a question like this, uh, you would imagine looking at the street. Right? You probably don't know the fact, uh, but you can imagine it and get an answer. So if I think hard enough and long enough, close my eyes, I can imagine the house next to mine. Uh, same thing if you tried to imagine what is the home screen on your phone. Uh, you might be able to know or retrieve a fact for what are some of the apps that are on the home screen, but you probably don't know what configuration they're in, right? Uh, if you wanted to answer that question, you'd probably have to close your eyes and using your mind's eye, really concentrate and try to visualize your home screen. Even though it's something you see like multiple times throughout the day, you probably don't have it committed to memory as a fact. So you would have to imagine it. Uh, that's a mental image. So what I've said here is that some of these questions, like what's your email address, what street do you live on? Those you answer with a fact that you have stored in, in uh, your semantic memory. You just know the answer to those. These you can answer potentially, but in order to answer them, you have to use mental imagery. You have to imagine looking at the street or looking at your phone and use your inner, uh, your inner eye or your inner ear to be able to answer questions like this. So mental imagery as we're going to define it and as Anderson defines it in the textbook is processing perceptual like information in the absence of an external source of that perceptual information. It's not exactly the same as perception. It's processing information like it's perception when the object isn't directly in front of you. So I can imagine looking at my house, uh, even though I'm not standing in front of it. I can close my eyes and imagine what it looks like. I can then look to the left and I can imagine uh, what the color of the house to the left of mine is. Does that seem clear to everyone? So let's talk about some of the properties or principles of visual images. What makes visual images distinct from memory in general? And what makes them distinct from perception? Uh, so some of the things that seem to be true of uh, visual images. First of all, they're often implicitly encoded. At no time uh, did I, in the X number of years that I've lived in the house that I live in, at no time that I stand in front of my house and say, I would like to commit this scene to memory uh, in case someone asks what color the house next to mine is. Uh, I just go in and out of my house a lot of times and maybe mow the lawn or run down the sidewalk or you know, uh, drive in and out of the garage, all sorts of things, right? So I see my house from lots of different angles and I kind of have a general sense of what it looks like, but I didn't actually try to learn those pieces of information. I didn't try to encode that image. It was implicitly encoded. The same thing with if you can remember the position of various apps on your home screen. You probably didn't try to commit that to memory, but to the extent that you can remember, it happened implicitly. So it was indirect. You didn't put a lot of effort into trying to form the image, but lots of exposure has allowed you to do this. So it's an unintentional storage of detail, and it's often never accessed. So if no one asks you, what color is the house next to the one to the left of your house? Unless somebody asks you that, you probably don't have the information. So you need to recreate it from all of that implicit encoding that's happened uh, over the number of days or years or months that you've lived uh, in your house. Uh, so that's principle number one. It's implicitly encoded. Principle number two, there's a perceptual equivalence. It's not exactly perception, but it's equivalent to perception, even at the neural level. 
which we'll show on a few slides later on in this lecture. Uh, finally, it has a spatial equivalence. Uh, that is, uh, there are spatial details. It takes you a certain amount of time to imagine uh, scanning from one part of a mental image to another. So if I imagine standing in front of my house, right? Uh, looking at my house, then looking at the house to the left. And then someone asks me, what color is the house across the street from you? In order to answer that, it's going to take me a little bit longer because in my mind's eye, I have to turn around to look across the street. So it preserves that spatial equivalence. I can't automatically reorient my image. I have to rotate the image as I would in real time. Uh, so we can, Im we can investigate the uh, characteristics or the properties of mental images uh, by looking at a couple of different experimental paradigms. One of these has to do with interference. Uh, we talked about one of these already when we talked about Brooks's uh, task looking at spatial pools of attention. So I'll bring that example back again and think about it from the imagery perspective. Uh, a second example uh, or evidence, source of evidence for imagery is the idea that you can manipulate these images in your mind's eye. Uh, just as uh, you know, the example of me having to turn around in real time or rotate my image uh, in, in order to answer questions about the house on the other side of the street, uh, that's what you would do uh, if you were even answering questions about uh, letters or words or shapes that you were imagining. Uh, and finally, these images seem to have pictorial properties. Uh, they preserve the visual spatial characteristics of the picture that you might have encoded uh, or uh, tried to store in your memory. Okay, so far. Uh, so let's talk about interference first. So here's an old study uh, from 1970, uh, which is one of the first uh, experiments to look at the effects of mental imagery. The Brooks task that we'll talk about next is from 1968. So this must have been what psychologists were doing uh, back in the late 1960s and 1970s, thinking about how uh, different kinds of information interfered uh, with other things. Uh, so in Siegel and Fusella's design, uh, you're, you were asked to form a visual or an auditory image. Uh, so imagine a sound or imagine an image. Uh, so a visual image or to imagine some kind of sound. So a visual image, auditory image. While you were imagining something, imagining a, 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 a signal on the screen or imagining a sound, uh, you were asked to detect either a visual signal or an auditory signal. So you're imagining a sound and then you're either detecting a picture or you're detecting uh, a sound. And what they found is that when it interfered with your image, you took you a little bit longer and you made more errors uh, on the thing that you were trying to detect. So uh, the percentage of detections, for example. So remember, you're imagining a sound and then you're trying to detect a sound. So while visualizing, uh, your performance on the uh, visual signal is lower than your performance on the auditory signal. While imagining an image or maintaining an auditory image, keeping a sound running through your mind's ear, uh, your performance is better to detect the visual signal. Uh, this is true both for overall performance and it's true for uh, false alarms. You make more errors. That seems to be the source of the mistakes. So while you're imagining a sound, you make more mistakes trying to detect a sound. When you're imagining an image, a visual image, you make more mistakes trying to detect a visual signal. This suggests that the perceptual mechanisms that are used in imagery are the same ones that are used in perception. Right? Because they're being occupied by this imagery task, they don't have the resources left over uh, to be able to uh, do the detection as well. So people are making those errors, making those mistakes. So the source of the error seems to be a false alarm. So straightforward, right? You imagine a sound, it's a little bit harder to actually detect the presence of sounds. Uh, just as a review, we already talked about this experiment a little bit. I just want to highlight it again. So remember in Lee Brooks's design, he had a sentence condition where subjects had to imagine uh, reciting a sentence back to themselves. It's kind of a verbal imagery task. Uh, and they had a spatial imagery task. So you either memorize the sentence and then scan through it as you say it to yourself, 
So that's verbal imagery. Uh, or you imagine this asterisk tracing around uh, the shape. Uh, you commit that to memory and then you do it in your mind's eye. You imagine uh, the asterisk moving around. And then you say uh, yes when it's on the extreme edge uh, or no when it's not on the extreme edge. In the sentence condition, you say yes if it's a noun and no if it's not a noun. So in both cases, you have an imagery task, one verbal, the other one's visual spatial. Uh, and then he found that there was an interference effect for the kind of responding. If your responding was one that depended on a, a visual spatial response, like finding the yes and no uh, letters on a sheet of paper, as you had to go down uh, and point yes or no to answer those questions, the interference was expected to be on the, in the visual spatial image. Uh, when you had to say yes or no, the interference would be on the verbal task. So if you're using your verbal uh, imagery, uh, verbal working memory, saying this to yourself using your uh, inner voice, that's where you're going to see the interference here. Uh, and that's what he found. This is the table that was missing, by the way, in the last uh, slide. Uh, when they had to uh, remember sentences, uh, their output, so this is the output time in seconds, meaning that it takes them longer uh, it took them longer to uh, respond yes or no on sentences with a vocal response, and it took them longer to point when they had to image uh, the diagrams. Uh, so you see that they can do it, but there's a reaction time. It takes you longer to complete the task when they make use of the same, uh, uh, the same resources. So imagining a visual spatial uh, diagram and trying to then respond with a visual spatial responding makes it take a little bit longer. Again, the image seems to be using some of the same basic processes that the response uh, and the actual process of responding visual spatially or verbally uh, uses. Is that good? So we've got interference as one of these uh, forms of evidence. A stronger form of evidence, though, for most, uh, for most of us uh, is the idea of manipulation. So remember, one of the characteristics of mental images is that they can be manipulated like real pictures. They preserve visual, spatial, uh, and image and pictorial-like properties. And if that's true, then they should behave in the mind's eye the way they do behave in uh, real space. Uh, and this work was done uh, in the, from the 1960s through the 1970s and 80s, uh, mostly by Roger Shepard. Uh, and so Roger Shepard was a, sort of a founding cognitive scientist who was interested in the idea of psychological space. Uh, the idea that things that are remembered or stored uh, in your memory uh, often preserve uh, spatial characteristics. They act as if they're in a physical space. Things that are closely related are close in physical space and they would be close in mental space. One of the things he did uh, in terms of uh, trying to understand this idea of psychological space was ask people to maintain an image and then rotate the image in order to answer questions. So this is called a mental rotation task. Uh, so you see, if, you see an object, see a stimulus, it disappears, you then have to form an image and then rotate that image in your mind's eye to say yes or no to a series of questions. Uh, what he found was that mental images take a certain amount of time to rotate almost exactly as if they were real images. Just like you can't take, you know, I can't take my phone and turn it upside down instantaneously, right? It takes longer to turn it 180 degrees than it does to turn it 45 degrees. Right? So it's gonna be a longer reaction time to get my phone completely upside down. And if I try to imagine my phone, it's not that I really like my phone all that much. It's just that it's the only object that's here that I can actually turn upside down. I wouldn't rotate my travel much. Uh, so, it would, if I want to imagine this rotating, uh, it's going to take me longer to imagine it rotating 180 degrees. So the inner image, uh, the image in your mental, uh, the mental image in your inner, uh, your, with your inner eye, is going to take a little bit longer uh, to rotate more. So here's how the task works: you see a letter, letter disappears, and then you have to answer: is the letter in the correct position or is it reversed? So mirror reversed. This is a correct K. This is a mirror reversed G. Does that make sense? So the K was yes. Uh, the G is backward. The B is yes. Uh, and what about this one? In order to do this one, what he found is that people should have to rotate it because it disappears and you answer the question. 
Uh, in order to determine if this is in the correct position, he predicted that people would have to rotate it in the upright in order to determine if it was forwards or backwards. Does that make sense? So is this forwards or backwards? Backwards, I think, isn't it? Yes, it is backwards. This forwards or backwards? This one's forwards. If you rotate it 180 degrees, you see it's a correct B. This is a correct P. This is an incorrect F. Uh, and so on. And what he found was that the time to respond was predicted almost perfectly by the angular disparity. Uh, this is a schematic. I couldn't find the actual graph uh, when I was putting these slides together. Uh, this is a schematic, but the uh, uh, time to respond is directly proportional, almost perfectly correlated with the angular disparity. In other words, uh, the further away the letter was, from the upright position, the longer it takes you to answer the simple question, is it forwards or backwards? When they're upright, you can do it really quickly. When they're at 180 degrees, it takes longer because you need to rotate the image to answer the question and you can't rotate it automatically. It takes you some time to rotate a mental image, just like it takes you time to rotate an actual object. And he's done this with other kinds of objects too. So uh, later looked at uh, different kinds of mental images for three-dimensional and two-dimensional objects. Uh, so in Shepard and Metzler's uh, study, they used what they called uh, uh, three-dimensional objects uh, and then had to say subjects had to respond same or different to pairs that they were presented. So uh, pair A, you can see that these objects are the same, but in order to answer, are they the same? Uh, you would have to rotate this one upright so that it looks exactly like the one on the left. Does that make sense? So in order to answer the question, you have to do a rotation. Uh, it's, in order to answer this question, you have to do a rotation and you can say this is not the same. Uh, in this case, uh, you have to rotate in two different dimensions. And what he found was the same result. When you rotate in one or two different dimensions, it still takes longer in a, in a way that's predicted directly by the angular disparity of the object. In other words, people were treating these images as if they were real objects in three-dimensional space. Shepard's conclusion is that psychological mental space is analogous to three-dimensional physical space. And so what he finds is that, uh, again, the response time in seconds, it takes longer from zero to 180 degrees. It takes you about a second here, about six seconds uh, when it uh, has to be rotated. This is picture plane pairs, which means you have to rotate them this way on this axis. Uh, this is the depth pair, which means you have to rotate them uh, along the other axis this way. Uh, it doesn't matter. Either one shows the same relationship. People can do these tasks. They can answer the question correctly. Uh, is this the same image or different? And they have to do that by rotating the objects and they rotate the objects in their mind's eye as if they were rotating the objects on the screen in front of them. Uh, so this seems to be fairly strong evidence that at least at the cognitive level, we're treating images like they are real objects. They're not in front of you at the time. Uh, they don't have to be rotating in front of you for you to see this, uh, but you treat them as if they are. Uh, they also, as we suggested earlier, images have picture-like properties. Uh, and these are some, this is some research, a variety of different kinds of research uh, done primarily by Stephen Coslin. Uh, and a lot of these tasks involve uh, committing an image to memory, committing a picture to memory, and then answering questions about it. Uh, we'll see one example, a scanning task uh, where subjects commit uh, a map to memory. And then they answer questions about objects on the map. And it takes them longer to answer questions about locations that are further away. Uh, just like we would do with uh, real maps of uh, geographic space. It takes you longer to imagine uh, or answer questions about areas that are close to your neighborhood than it would about areas that are farther from your neighborhood because you have to scan across uh, the city. Uh, we'll talk briefly about, we won't talk about the zooming in tasks and the property verification tasks. These are all sort of in the same cluster of kinds of experiments where you're given an image and then you're asked to scan to answer questions, zoom in to answer questions about fine details or zoom out to answer questions about uh, things that are farther away or verify property. 
I do want to leave a little bit of time to talk about the neuropsychology of mental images because we want to talk and show some evidence about how maintaining an image activates areas of the brain analogous to areas of the brain that would be active if you were doing that action or doing that um, uh, behavior. Uh, so Coslin's one of his most famous uh, experiments is this map experiment. Okay, so in the map experiment, uh, in these types of experiments, what you would do is you would see a fictitious island. A map with some different uh, objects on it. So you've got a hut here and a, a tree. There's a little tall grass prairie there, some rocks and so on. Basic features, right? These are things that you can label, so you can use language to label them. Uh, but you also use your imagery uh, processes to imagine the spatial arrangement. So it's one thing to remember using uh, propositional logic to say there is a tree, there is a wishing well, there is a house, right? Uh, but in order to, to store the location relative to the other objects, you need to create an image because you don't know how far away these are, right? There's no scale. Uh, we don't know if we're talking about just on the picture or if we're talking about uh, several hundred meters or a mile uh, or 20 feet. Uh, or two centimeters. We don't know the scale, right? So the way in, in which you would be able to commit this object or series of objects to memory to answer questions about it is to imagine the whole thing. So you try to encode the entire thing, it's holistic process. And then when you answer questions, uh, you would answer questions based on imagining uh, this map. What he found was that when subjects were asked to, do I have the results in the next page? Yeah. So when subjects were asked to imagine starting at one of these objects and then scan to the other, it would take them relatively longer if uh, it was an object that was farther away on the map. In other words, you can't move through your image faster than you could move through objects in front of you. So you can't automatically fix your image gaze, your mental gaze on the hut, and then uh, move automatically or instantaneously uh, to the uh, image of the rocks up at the top. It takes you longer to get from the hut to the rocks than it does to take you to get from the hut uh, to the wishing well. These reaction times seem to be consistent or preserve this spatial characteristic. So again, time in seconds and the distance in centimeters on the actual map itself. Uh, the longer it takes you, uh, the, sorry, the farther away things are on the map, the longer it's going to take you to scan or answer questions or verify properties about those objects. So whether you're scanning across or verifying whether or not there is a wishing well on the map, uh, these kinds of things take longer in a way that's proportional uh, to the actual spatial relationships. So we're talking about visual imagery. Of course, you see the same kinds of things in auditory imagery. If you're imagining a song, for example, so if you're sort of thinking of a song uh, in your mind, you can't get to the second part of the song, the second verse or a phrase that's further on down instantaneously, right? You kind of have to sing your way through. Uh, it's kind of like being stuck. You know, people like me who can't alphabetize things without singing through the alphabet. So I can alphabetize, put in alphabetical order A, B, and C. But if I have to figure out which one comes first later in the alphabet, it takes me longer because I have to sing the whole way through the alphabet. So I have to go through you know, the, the auditory image of getting to the end of the song. You can't jump ahead in a song. Uh, you've got to play that through your auditory imagery as well. Uh, some people can jump ahead to different phrases or verses in a song, uh, but you can't jump around mid phrase, just like you can't jump around on this map. Uh, whoops, there we go, uh, directly from one location uh, to the next. So, does that seem pretty clear so far? So, we've got this form of mental representation that's directly tied to perception. Uh, it seems to preserve objects as if they were real objects in front of us, but they're not in front of us anymore. So we seem to be able to treat them as if we're looking at them, uh, even if we're trying to recreate them uh, in our mind. Uh, so I want to cover two, two or three additional topics about images, uh, one of which to show how they are not exactly like perception. So remember, we described an image as being perception-like. 
It's not exactly equivalent, but it's very close. The difference is, of course, with perception, the object is in front of you. With imagery, the object is not in front of you. And you use uh, other processes to activate the brain areas uh, that would be relevant. So one question is, are these images exactly like perception? And if they're not, how, where, what are some of the ways in which they're not exactly like perception? Uh, some work, um, uh, some work by Dan Riesberg suggests that they can't be reinterpreted. Uh, so when you have a mental image, uh, you can't change the mental image uh, the way you can with perception. Uh, so with a visual input, you can see different things about that visual input. Right? You can uh, look for more detail. You can go back and reinspect something. So if you're looking for features and you missed them the first time, you can go back and find them. Uh, with, a, with an image, you may not be able to do that because it's not in front of you. You're using your memory to be able to recreate the experience. And if you didn't encode those features the first time, you won't be able to recreate them the second time. Uh, did you all watch the online video where we had the picture of the frog that turned over and became a horse? So if you haven't seen that, you know, uh, so if you've seen that, you know the one that I'm talking about. And I suggested in that lecture when I was recording it, that if I asked you to imagine it and then imagining it tilting it forward, most of you, uh, most of us uh, would not be able to imagine it turning into a horse, right? You would imagine it just being a frog sitting on its nose. And the suggestion is that images can't be reinterpreted the way real objects can. You can reinterpret a real object based on a new perspective uh, or a new viewpoint. But you can't do that with an image. Um, work from Chambers and Riesberg, where they suggested that mental images really can't be ambiguous the way some figures are. Uh, now, most figures are not ambiguous, but we do have examples of things that can be bistable. So a bistable image is something that can simultaneously be, more, be interpreted in more than one way. Uh, you've probably seen examples of them. They are things like the duck rabbit, right? Uh, so the duck rabbit can be uh, reinterpreted uh, simultaneously. You can flip back and forth between bunny rabbit with his little head, with his little mouth there in his ears, or duck, uh, sort of an arrogant duck with his head uh, sitting back and the, uh, uh, the beak sort of half open. So you can see both of them, right? You can simultaneously see a duck and a rabbit, and you can switch back and forth between the two, usually by uh, focusing on one aspect of the picture. Now you've probably you've all seen this before, but uh, there are you can you can see bistable images quickly and not realize that they're bistable. So suppose we asked some subjects uh, to see this image first and interpret it only as one thing. So they get the picture, it goes away, and they label it as a rabbit or as a duck. Uh, you've only got one image for it. Same thing with the stairs, it's either going up or down, or the Necker cube is either going one direction uh, or the other. So we can have some of these bistable images. Uh, stimulus B uh, is uh, just the idea of reversing. It doesn't actually have two interpretations. Does that seem clear? So some of these can be reversed. And what they found is that once subjects had an interpretation, and then try to recreate it from their image, uh, they could only reinterpret one, they could only recreate one image. So if you thought it was a duck, uh, you recreated a duck, albeit not, very, not one that actually looks like the original duck rabbit, one that's a little bit more duck-like. Uh, if you thought it was a rabbit, I'm not even sure what this person was going for, but this is clearly sort of rabbit-like and not duck-like. Uh, and so what they found is that people picked one, uh, and they picked that one uh, interpretation, and that's how they recreated the object. Uh, more interestingly is that they could not reverse it from an image. They could reverse it from their own drawing, however. Uh, so when you were maintaining an image, if you encoded it as a duck, and then you were asked, can you think of any other way in which this object can be, can be interpreted? Uh, does this duck look like anything else to you? Zero subjects were able to do that. Uh, this assumes, of course, that they don't know that it's a reversible image, right? So they have to see it quickly. Um, but they're not able to reinterpret the image itself. They can reinterpret 
the drawing. They can reinterpret their own drawing and they can reinterpret the duck rabbit drawing. So you can be asked to reverse this image and you can see it in front of you and you can then do the reversal. But if you've encoded it as one thing and you're using some top-down knowledge to remember it as a duck uh, or as a rabbit, and then you try to reinterpret from the image only, it does seem to be impossible uh, for subjects to do that. It doesn't mean it's entirely impossible, but it's not very easy. Yes. So they can reinterpret it in their drawing. Do you mean like they drew it and then were able to put it in their mind or they could just draw it backwards? So they could, they could look at their own drawing and reverse it. Okay. Uh, so the subject could look at their own drawing and say, yeah, I could see how that could be a rabbit. Uh, so they can, as long as the image is in front of them, I shouldn't use the word image. As long as the picture is in front of them, they can reverse the picture and think about both interpretations. But when they're doing it in their mind's eye, it seems to be constrained by the label that they've given it and the knowledge they've given it. That suggests that the images are not directly like perception. They're perception-like, and they're being driven by tacit knowledge. They're being driven by your knowledge of what a duck would look like or what a rabbit would look like. So you've labeled it rabbit, and you've given it rabbit-like features in your image. It still preserves a lot of the visual spatial characteristics of the picture that you were encoding, uh, but it can't preserve things that you did not encode. And if you did not encode duck-like properties, uh, you wouldn't encode it, uh, wouldn't be able to switch it or reverse it to be the duck when in fact you had encoded the rabbit in the first place. Does that seem clear? Mm -hmm. So that's one of the limits of imagery versus perception. Perception does allow you the opportunity to look at something from a different perspective or to look at it from a different angle or in a different light. Uh, it's very difficult to imagine something uh, that you haven't seen before in a different light or a different angle or a different perspective. Um, however, uh, imagery does get very close. Uh, so we talked about this a few weeks ago. Um, was this in an online or was this on a live lecture? I think this was an online lecture, wasn't it? When I was talking about uh, fMRI. And I suggested that there was a, some of the studies using fMRI to communicate with individuals with disorders of consciousness. So people with locked in syndrome who would otherwise appear to have no ability to communicate uh, to, with the outside world. They show no recognition. Uh, they show, show no uh, ability to recognize that someone's talking to them. They can't answer questions, but you can use their imagery as a way to co communicate with them. So you can ask subjects to imagine uh, playing tennis and the areas that correspond uh, to the action of playing tennis uh, will be active in normal controls as well as individuals with disorders of consciousness. Uh, you can then use that as a proxy for yes and no. Uh, so you can ask them to imagine one behavior uh, when the answer to a question is yes, and then some other behavior with different areas of activation when the answer is no. I also talk, I have another example of this in the online lecture when I talk about in individual words uh, that correspond to actions that you would carry out with your, on your face, with your hands, or with your legs. And those also seem to activate areas of the brain consistent with the, mo the areas of the, uh, the motor cortex that activate your fingers, uh, your facial muscles, or your uh, legs and feet. Uh, so when you activate or move those, ob those areas of the body, uh, those areas of the brain are more active. When you ask people to imagine or even just listen to words that correspond to those areas of the body, those areas of the brain also become active. So there does seem to be something connecting the neural activation uh, that's consistent with imaging. A uh, final example that I want to talk about, um, I'll go, this one will take just a little bit more, and then we should be just about finished. Um, amazingly, we will actually finish up with exactly on time, I think. We're supposed to finish at 2.20, right? Yeah. Okay, we're doing fine. Is this my last example? This is my last example. This is actually going to work. It will work if I don't keep talking about it. Um, so this has to do with imagery and eye movements. Uh, and I really like this experiment. Uh, this is a study that shows that your eyes will move even if there's nothing for them to look at in a way that corresponds to when there was something to look at. 
right? Even when you're thinking about something, when you're holding a picture in your mind's eye, your eyes seem to move as if the image is right, as if the picture is right in front of you, even when you're not looking at it. Uh, so they used an eye tracker uh, in this study to measure where you're looking at. Uh, so if anybody's ever seen an eye tracker or been in an eye tracking experiment, just a simple infrared camera bounces off the back of your retina and it can tell where you're looking at. So if you're reading something, uh, you can see exactly what words you're reading. Uh, if you're looking at a picture, you can see where on the picture uh, the subject is looking. Uh, so there's two experiments I want to talk about. The first experiment, uh, subjects were shown uh, very simple shapes like triangles and squares and so on. Uh, so we get a baseline. So we figure out where they're looking in general. Then we show them for five seconds a triangle. Uh, the triangle is on the screen for 500 milliseconds or five seconds, then it disappears. Uh, and then they're asked to imagine the very same triangle on the next slide for five seconds. So they see a triangle and then they imagine a triangle with nothing to look at. Very simple, straightforward imagery task, right? Here's a shape look at it for five seconds, it goes away. Now imagine it for five seconds where you're not looking at anything. Uh, and then you stop the task. Uh, and then you do some additional uh, stimuli, right? So on each trial, you're seeing a shape and then you're asked to imagine the shape. So what they did uh, was they plotted where people look for that five second period in two dimensional space. So in other words, where on the screen are you looking? Uh, here are all the subjects, the cumulative fixation for all participants plotted in X, Y positions for the two different triangles. Here they are actually looking at the triangle. And you can see that when they're looking at the blue triangle, the upright triangle, uh, their fixations are basically show you where the triangle is, right? This is not the actual triangle. This is just a plot of where they're looking on the screen. And not surprisingly, it shows that they're looking at the triangle on the screen. Uh, so their eye fixations uh, appear in sort of that triangle shape. When they're looking at an upside down triangle, those are the red uh, fixations. Uh, and you can see that they're also looking at the boundaries and the body of the triangle. So this would suggest something that should be completely uncontroversial. When there's a triangle on the screen and you're asked to look at the triangle, you actually look at the triangle and you follow the contours of the triangle. Then when you're asked to imagine the very same triangle, your eyes do the same thing spontaneously. Uh, they seem to involuntarily trace the shape of where the triangle had been, even though it's not there anymore. Uh, so you can see that when you're asked to imagine the upright triangle, uh, again, the blue fixations, uh, subjects uh, look where that triangle was. It's not there anymore. There's no after image because that's been taken away by the mask. Uh, so it's just a blank screen. All they're doing is looking on the blank screen in exactly the same configuration as the original triangle. They're looking in the blank screen in the, exactly, in the exact configuration of the other triangle. This suggests that maintaining an image, uh, in addition to seeming to have visual spatial characteristics in the mind's eye, the inner vision, uh, also seems to work its way down the whole way to the muscles that control your eye movement. Uh, there's nothing to look at. It's a completely blank screen, but your eyes look where the object was uh, as you're imagining it. Uh, importantly, when you saw the upside down triangle, uh, those are the red fixations, you weren't imagining the other triangles. So it's not like you were looking all over the place and imagining other things. Uh, your eyes were tracing where the particular triangle that you were asked to imagine was. Second study, uh, same authors, same experiment, same paper. They just did a second study where they asked subjects to see, uh, to, to view uh, different uh, three-dimensional style uh, pictures of animals. Uh, you may wonder why they don't appear to uh, preserve normal size. This is an enormous wasp uh, that's almost the size of an elephant and an enormous bunny rabbit that's uh, almost the size of an elephant. But again, the wasp is bigger. You can imagine why they just want to make sure that things take up the same amount of space uh, on the computer screen. So tiny elephant, giant wasp, either way, the point is it's roughly the same amount of space. But you can see that there are some key features. If you were looking at the bunny rabbit, what's the first thing that draws your attention? Little pink ears, right? I mean, that's what tell, that's what lets you know that that's a bunny rabbit, not something else. It has bunny rabbit ears. 
Uh, when you're looking at the camel, I would look at the neck and maybe the hump, right? There are certain features that let you know it's the camel and not something else. Uh, when you look at the goat, you probably look at the horns. When you look at the elephant, you probably look at the tusk. When you look at this bee, you probably just are shocked at how large it is. Uh, when you look at the uh, caribou, you probably look at the antlers. So the point is there are certain features that most of us are gonna look at, and that's what they find by the way, uh, when they look at the eye tracking, is that we look at the features that are important for identifying those objects, diagnostic features. Uh, we look at different things for the rabbit than for the cow. Now, unlike the previous study where we could sort of see your fixations in a triangle shape, it's not quite as easy for this because there's a lot of different areas that people can look at. Uh, they're more complicated objects. So what they did was they divided the picture up into four quadrants. And they calculated, relatively speaking, how often do you correspond? Do you look here in the top in the head area? How long would you look here, here, and here? So for each of those objects, they kind of divide the animal up into four quadrants and then look to see how long you look at each one of those quadrants. For some animals, the important features are in the upper right quadrant. For other animals, they might be in the lower right quadrant and so on. It doesn't matter which quadrant. The point is there are important features that you would look at. Then when they ask people to image, uh, they track their eye movements again when you're imagining the bunny rabbit or imagining the goat or imagining the camel. And what they do then, what they did then was correlate the amount of looking time uh, for imagery versus uh, perception. And they found a fairly strong and straightforward linear relationship. In other words, if you spent a lot of time in an area, uh, looking at an area when it was an image, uh, or sorry, when it was a picture, you would spend this, a lot of time looking at that same area in the image. And when there were quadrants that you didn't spend much time looking at when you actually saw the picture, you spent less time looking in that region of space when you had to imagine the object. So a correlation uh, between the quadrants when you saw them versus the quadrants when you imagined them. So for both of these studies, it seems to suggest that imagery uh, maintains these pictorial qualities to the extent that you move your eyes uh, where something was, even when it isn't. Uh, so let's summarize uh, in I'm amazed we're actually finishing on time. This is great. Uh, so let's summarize uh, this topic and then just one uh, quick word about the next two topics. Uh, these images preserve visual and spatial properties of the actual object, uh, whether it's interference or seen in mental rotation uh, or seen in things like these eye tracking studies. Uh, they can be manipulated and inspected like actual pictures, though only to a point. You can't reinterpret the image if you didn't encode the features that are bistable. Uh, and evidence, of course, from neuropsychology indicates that brain areas active during perception seem to be active uh, during imagery. So this topic, uh, this topic of imagery, uh, the chapter also has some information on visual memory, uh, memory for pictures and memory for images and how you use vision in memory. So you should be familiar with those. We'll touch on that briefly in the online lecture when I talk about knowledge systems and I talk about perceptual, perceptual based knowledge. So perceptual symbol systems and embodied cognition. That's the online lecture. So make sure you have a chance to listen to that before the quiz because that material will be on the quiz on Wednesday. Uh, and then on Wednesday, I'll talk about concepts and categories in class. All of that material will be on the quiz as well. Okay, great. See you on Wednesday.